Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a fabulous box. Uh, I really, this is just an amazing collection of music by Irvin Schulhoff, one of the most talented of those supposedly, theoretically, according to the Nazis, Jewish decadent composers whose music was banned and erased effectively. Um, by the Germans during the Second World War and the period leading up to it. He passed away, what was it, in 1942 in a German internment camp and was just a remarkably gifted guy, full of character, and he's so typical of his era. His music was highly ideologically motivated, and that ideology evolved from a sort of crazy Dadaist 1920s Berlin crazy style, full of influences of jazz and impressionism and everything he could get his hands on and folk music and all kinds of stuff. And then he became a serious left-wing proletarian supporter and he began to write music that was extremely populist, agitprop, socialist, realist, which a lot of people don't particularly care for. I don't think all of it's as bad as people say it is, but some of it is rather, well, let's just say um, industrial sounding. It's kind of getting the job done, but it's fascinating to hear and interesting to hear in the context of his evolution. He also set a, made a cantata on the Communist Manifesto, which was recorded by Carl Anschel, no less. It's in that Anschel radio recordings box. And actually, Superfund has another recording of it, too. I, I just fascinating guy. Absolutely fascinating guy. And this box on Capriccio has six discs of his juiciest music. Really an extraordinary box. The only thing that's missing that I think would have made it just stellar is the first symphony, which is on CPO, and it's been recorded by Superfond and Koch. There are like three recordings of it. We still need more. It's not available enough, and it's such an enchanting work. But these other pieces are equally marvelous, and I want to tell you what they are so that we can just get a sense of what's in here and play you some samples as well. So let's just open up the box here, and once again, it's on Capriccio. Then I'll go through the artists as we go through it. Here's the booklet. It's a very good booklet. You get like nice notes. So, uh, Compact Disc 1 has Symphonies 2. Symphony number 2, which was actually, I think, written for radio, 1932. It's kind of the end of his, his initial experimental phase. And it's just, it's just a delight to listen to. It has one of those scherzo a la jazz pieces that he was very, very frequently writing. And they are, you know, I mean, the jazz element, you know, the, the European version of what jazz was is not quite the American version of what jazz was, but it's a, it's a wonderful amalgam of influences that I think is simply delightful. Then we have his Suite for Chamber Orchestra, which is completely nuts. The movements are ragtime, Vols Boston, a tango, a shimmy, step, and jazz. And Symphony Number no. 5, which is one of his sort of socialist realist pieces, the biggest of those last three symphonies that were all in that format. And I, I think it's a good work. I really do. But, you know, you'll have to decide whether, whether you agree with the aesthetic. You know, it's a new block-like simplicity full of march rhythms and, and simple song ideas, but it's extremely well done. I mean, the man was immensely gifted and really carried these things out with great gusto and energy. And as long as it's not boring, then I'm, I'm sort of okay with it, really. Compact Disc 2. Well, let's see who's doing that. Wait a minute. Let's be clear. It's... Uh, the Bavaria Radio Symphony Orchestra under James Conlon, and it's marvelously played and recorded. Symphony number two. Now, this one has got, it's like one of my favorites. You get the double concerto for flute and piano, string orchestra, and two horns. This is a very neoclassical kind of, you know, busy, chugging, Stravinskyan, that, that kind of thing. You know, a Hindemith. That Neue Sachlichkeit, the new objectivity. It's busy and fun and colorful and, and just it's interesting to listen to. You also get his concerto for string quartet and wind ensemble, which is even more characterful and just oodles of fun. 
It really is. Um, and that's with the Leipzig String Quartet, actually. This whole thing is with the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra Berlin under Roland Klutig. And we also have, let's see, mm, ah, yes, the best of all, the Concerto for Piano and Small Orchestra, Opus 43. Now, this comes from 1923. There have been many recordings of this concerto. They really have. There was, there's, it was done by Decca. It was done by, you know, a Superfawn had it, and again, Koch had it, and a bunch of people had it. It's just an amazing piece of music. Absolutely amazing. And what makes it so interesting to me, um, one of the things anyway that makes it so interesting, is that it's, it's a single movement. The small orchestra is small only insofar as it doesn't have like lots of brass and whatnot, but it has an, just an epically huge percussion section, including a typewriter. And it, the thing that's so amazing about the piece is that it remarkably anticipates the, the structure of Ravel's left-hand piano concerto. I've actually seen one disc in which the two works are put together on the same disc because they really ought to be paired. They deserve to be paired. But this, this predates the Ravel by about 10 years, and it really, it really begs the question of what Ravel might have been listening to. You know, Ravel is such an interesting composer in that he sort of lives in his own Ravelian bubble. Nobody talks about him in terms of, first of all, being a major voice, and second of all, having influences. You know, that he was out there listening to other music, and maybe some of that, like, got into his hermetically sealed, you know, fairy tale universe. And the Ravel is, is a far more structured piece than this sort of Dadaist phantasmagoria that Schulhoff produces, but the forms are unbelievably similar. It begins with a piano cadenza and a slow presentation of themes the, the, based on very simple ideas. You know, the Ravel, remember the Ravel? You know, it just basically is, you know, when it gets going in the middle section, da 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 that's that one. And the Schulhoff is da 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 I mean, that's it. <laughs> And then there's a busy central jazz episode based on jazz. And everything goes crazy. And the Ravel, it's a little bit more, you know, structured and organized as a section here. It just kind of goes nuts. I want to play you a bit of that. I just want you to hear it. It's so cool. Um, this is with, who's the pianist here? Frank Immo Zichner, very fine pianist. And here is a bit of the central a la jazz interlude here. It's Allegro a la jazz. Um, from the Schulhoff Concerto for Small Orchestra and Piano. Take a listen to this. This is just fun. <laughs> stuff, huh? Irresistible. But what makes it even more Ravelian is that after this, this wild jazz interlude, the music returns to the atmosphere of the, of the opening. In, in Schulhoff's case, in a very, very tender, wonderful moment for piano and solo violin, and it sounds so Ravelian. I mean, my God, first time I heard it, I went, oh, goodness, that's Ravel. Wow. Here's a little bit of that. It's just remarkable. Thank you. 
And of course, in the Ravel, it returns to the music of the opening. And then there's a wind-up that brings back the, the jazzy stuff for the, final, for the final cadence, which is what happens in Shulaf and what happens in Ravel. It's a marvelous correspondence, and it just, just makes you think what was going on. I could have done a separate video about just those two works, one of the sequel, pre prequel things. And I may do it because, you know, I, I've said before, I know it's a little repetitious, but you, you want to make the case for some fabulous, unfamiliar music. You have to do it through a certain amount of repetition. You have to keep saying, yes, listen to this. It's really cool. And I'll probably, I can do clips of both and you can, you know. So that may be coming, but I just want to make the point. It's just a brilliantly wonderful piece. And then CD2 is rounded off with a really fun arrangement by Schulhoff's uh, Beethoven's Rage Over a Lost Penny, which is really, really cool. It's, it's very bizarre and, and very interesting. Now, discs three and four contain chamber music and marvelous chamber music. You get the string quartet number one string, and the five pieces for string quartet, which again have, there are these wonderful character dance things. You know, there's, there's a la vals Viennese and a serenata and a la Cheka and a la tango and a la tarantella. And then there's the second string quartet, which is really a masterpiece, just a beautiful, beautiful work. And they're all performed by the Peterson Quartet, which is such a great group. They really are. They have a fantastic discography on Capriccio of all kinds of interesting stuff, um, some of which is available and some of which isn't, you know. They need a box. We need a box. An another box. And why not? Let's have a box. But the performances are marvelous. And again, I want to play you a little bit of the first string quartet. The first string quartet has a third movement, which is called, it's kind of a scherzo, and it's just unbelievably fun and colorful. It's called, wait a second, ah, here we go, Allegro Giocoso alla Slovaka. And Slovak it is. It is sort of an apotheosis of all of those Dvorak, Janicek, you know, Czech, Slovak folk things. And it's only two and a half minutes long, but it's just, it's just, well, just listen to it. It's so colorful and entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. 
Marvelous, marvelous music. It really is. Now, this disc four has his early string quartet in G major from 1918, which precedes all of these these sort of Dadaist experimental things. It's it's much more in the in the Hindemith late German constructive phase of music writing, um, but it's no less interesting to hear. It's a very substantial work, and then the string sextet. Uh, which is delightful. It has a burlesque. He liked to end with slow movements, by the way. The sextet ends with an adagio, so does the second quartet. Then the sonata for solo violin, which is absolutely brilliant. And the duo for violin and cello, which has a zingaresca second movement. See these folk things pop up here and there. They're always very colorful. And again, this is with members of the Peterson Quartet. It's absolutely great. Now, disc five is piano music, so is disc six. And his piano music is really wild. It's where it was his instrument. It was where he wrote a lot of music for like radio broadcast. And you know, he was a, he had, he wrote popular dance music under a pseudonym. So the, the rhythm and urgency of his music is always very, very noteworthy. And you have the first piano, the first piano sonata, which has, you know, allegro moderato grotesco. You know, it's, you, you can tell that his his musical aesthetic at this point was was to try and shock and stun. And oh goodness, it did that. And then the five burlesques, which are hilarious and enormous fun. And then the piano sonata number three, uh, which has a funeral march in it that's quite moving. And a, and a finale retrospectivo, which obviously looks back at what we've heard. And then there's five grotesques. Opus 21, and six ironies for piano four hands. And, you know, you've got Tempo di Fox, and then Foxtrot as a finale, and, we've got, and, and an Allegra Marcia Militaristica. Let's not forget that either. And then we have five pic picturesques, and they are delightful. They have a ragtime, and there's a wonderful piece that's called In Futurum, In the Future, which is a minute and 41 seconds long, and it's completely silent. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an anticipation of what John Cage would be doing quite a bit later, because this is only his opus three, and it's dedicated to the painter and Dadaist, George Gross. So this is one of his Dadaist works. And then you get five, ja then you get, well, not five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, jazz improvisations for two pianos. And these are very, very interesting because what Shulhoff did was he wrote the first piano part and you were supposed to improvise the second piano part, which, you know, we don't have, uh, I think there were only two movements that we have Shulhoff's own improvisations. But in this, in this case, we've got Margaret Babinski, Maria Lettberg, and Andreas Wickdahl um, as, as the pianists. And they do a very, very, very good job imagining what Shulhoff might have done on the, on the bass that he actually composed. And that, my friends, is six fabulous discs of Irvin Schulhoff, a composer who really deserves to be, well, I don't know, in the mainstream of the repertoire. It's so much fun. There's so much talent and imagination in this music, and it really deserves to be better known, at least among collectors. You know, we always say, well, we say, well it should be, should be standard repertoire. They should be playing it every 15 minutes. It should be in every concert hall. Well, maybe not, you know? I mean, there's only room for so much, right? But more people should know it. It should be available. It should be part of the, the fund of things from which we draw regularly in order to enhance our musical existence because Schulhoff's music is musically enhancing. And that is the point I wanted to make. So I hope you've enjoyed this little survey of this Capriccio box. Like I said, these are all inexpensive boxes and they're just marvelously performed and recorded. So uh, there are wonderful ways to just build up your collection with, with a pile of really good stuff. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care. <laughs>